when I came back from Davis Library and found out that babies, you know, weren't given anesthesia and they were paralyzed, I drove up this road and pulled over here and just sobbed. At first I was just in shock and then I just sobbed and sobbed and then I was so, then I felt furious and started banging my steer steering wheel and you're just all alone with this stuff, you know, so. And then after that I felt huge relief, like, oh, that's what's, that's what's been disturbing me my whole life. Uh, just all from the kinds of ways that I learned to hold my breath to being terrified to live my life fully. I wasn't getting any nourishment, so I was starving to death. And I was operating on it at 26 days old. I'm Fred Vanderbom. I was born in 1945, just after the end of the Second World War, in the, one of the northern provinces of the Netherlands. I had a pyloric stenosis and I had a stomach blockage between my, well, near my small intestine. At the age of five and a half, my father and mother accepted an invitation or request to go and work among Dutch immigrants settling in Australia in the post-war war migration boom. My mom would watch me from a window in the hallway and uh, she told me quite a bit about how I looked back then, uh, how big the tubes were, because everything was very chunky and funky in a way. Only 10 days after I was born, I had surgery for a stomach blockage condition. The anesthesiologist would have given me, you know, the curare. It's a paralytic drug and it's used, the way they discovered it was in South, Afri South America, rather. It was used to, to make poison darts. Well, and they used it to, to hunt to kill animals, you, it cuts their breath off immediately, they can't breathe. They wanted to paralyze me so I wouldn't move so that they could cut without me flailing around. I was separated from my mother for between two and three weeks. Um, she had to deliver milk to the hospital every day for me to be given. But from what I understand from the public record, mum has never been willing to talk about this. I was not I was kept separate and quarantined from her. I started thinking about making the film about three years ago. Since then, it's been deciding how to do it, and also through my own personal growth to actually be able to make the film and to understand why I was making it. Before January 2011 is the goal right now. I've been working on this project in different forms over the last eight years. It basically started as something where I focused more on uh, the reason why I had surgery, the disease, the, you know, the, the disorder itself. Um, and through that research, I came across uh, the whole idea of infant surgery without anesthesia. My name is Wendy Patrice Williams. I grew up in uh, Hillside, New Jersey, which is a town right on the border of Newark, New Jersey. I grew up with my dad, my brother, and my mom. Went to the University of Miami at first because I wanted to study marine biology and I stayed there for about two and a half years and then I trans you know I transferred to Barnard College in New York City for a year and dropped out. I ended up having a breakdown because this dentist got me going on Valium and they didn't know back in the 70s that Valium was addictive and um, I got addicted to it and one day threw it out because a friend was worried about me and said, stop taking those horrible drugs, and I did, and then I had a horrible withdrawal reaction and, and then uh, attempted suicide. I decided instead of go to uh, a mental institution where I was afraid of the different strategies and techniques that they use to quote unquote cure people, I joined a rehabilitation community called Synanon. By then Synanon had become somewhat of a cult, somewhat of a, you know, kind of dicey. So my brother had to kind of find me through uh, listening to the radio on his car, driving through the hills, listening for the Synanon radio station. And he 
tuned in and heard there was a Synanon party and drove down and found me at the party and arranged, we arranged when I would kind of break out. <laughs> so then I uh, stayed with him and then I moved to Oakland and just started a whole new life on the West Coast. My name is Linda Gant. I'm a board certified art therapist and I've been an art therapist for about 40 years. Also for the past 20 years I've been a trauma therapist. My husband Lou Tennant and I developed a particular model of understanding trauma which we call the instinctual trauma response. In the mid-1970s nobody was screening for trauma. People didn't want to talk about trauma because they didn't know what to do with it. In many cases during the 20th century, infants who underwent surgery were given minimal or no pain relief. In many ways I had a, uh, a pleasant childhood and adolescence in Sydney and yet there was a, an inner part of me which was troubled in ways that I couldn't understand at the time but which affected my private sense of well-being and confidence and um, my self-image. My name is Jolene Philo and I am a writer and speaker. Most of the books I've written deal with parenting children with special needs and caregiving and my most recent book is about post-traumatic stress disorder in children and my um, my journey as a caregiver and, and in special needs began very early when I was two years old. My dad was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The second piece of that journey was, began in 1982 when my husband and I had our first child. Our son was born in Spearfish, South Dakota, and, uh, which was a small city hospital. Hiram would go and check on him in the nursery and came back and said, you know, they're around his little bed a lot and they've kind of propped him up and it's, I wonder if he's having trouble breathing. In the morning the doctor came and said they, they had done an x-ray and couldn't see something but they needed to transfer him to Rapid City uh, where they could do more tests. We didn't think to ask can we see him before we go or anything. He was just whisked off in the ambulance. The doctor told me that our son had a tracheal esophageal fistula which means it came down from his throat and made a blind pouch, his esophagus did, and it came up from his stomach and hooked into his trachea. And the doctor said he needs to have surgery right away and the closest hospitals are um, in, in Denver, Colorado or Omaha, Nebraska, where do you want him sent? They were sending for the plane to come up and pick up our son. We got a call about midnight that our son had made it through surgery and was resting in the neonatal intensive care. We caught up with him then, two days later. It was the old-fashioned NICU, very brightly lit. Um, it was kind of an L-shaped room. There was a nurse's station outside. You went through these big doors. And I remember just going past all those isolates, all those, all those tubes and needles and, and uh, patches on him. It was, it was really hard to see and the nurse said you really should you should hold him he needs you to hold him and and we were like well really all these tubes oh no we can arrange things and she lifted him up to give him to us and we could see him wince and we were like are you sure we you, you know we can just put our hands in we don't need to hold him if it's hurting him and she said oh no no don't worry uh, babe, newborns don't feel pain and they won't remember it anyway I had so much rage as a 12 year old, like I'd been holding my rage in for a decade and or more and it came out. It came out like a volcano. I think I took on another personality during that period. I don't think I was schizophrenic or anything. I dressed up like a hard girl, they call it. I wore black every day. I had a gang, then everybody would kind of follow what I did. So we just disrupted and made everybody miserable. A black leather jacket, tight pants, leather boots, um, teased my hair all up, and had my little switchblade. If anybody messed with me, I would cut them. I, I just, just get in my space. I'll, I would walk miles just, just to, I would literally go out of the house and just walk all night because I couldn't stand myself. One summer I just left my home 
I told my mother I was going somewhere, and we went down the shore and stayed down the shore at this place, Pat's place. He was a pimp for older women, and he let us uh, stay with him, and his, he had owned an apartment building and a laundromat. And really, I just wanted to die, honestly. I just wanted to die. I felt trapped. During that period, I did, you know, take an overdose of aspirin to kill myself. I slit my wrist to, to kill myself. And I had uh, two of my friends die during that period, which, which uh, kind of pushed me to leave that life behind. I guess I didn't want to die completely. I was very רק העיניים שלך הסתכלו. היית תחת ההשפעה עדיין של ההרדמה, אז לקח זמן עד, ש... עד שיצאת מזה. I was, uh, I was shocked, I, I didn't know about it, I, was, I wasn't aware of it at all, until uh, Roy told me about it. I know every time before surgery, the doctor came in and I had to sign uh, my agreement, and I trusted them completely. I accepted uh, whatever they were telling me because I felt that they were professionals and uh, I respected. I respected them and their knowledge. It was also a, a regular, normal uh, delivery. The only thing after a day, um, they told me that uh, at the hospital that there was a problem. Uh, Roy had a, uh, he had like a big belly and uh, like a green stuff was coming out of his mouth. So uh, we called, uh, we invited uh, the specialists and they told me that he has Hirschsprung disease and that he will have to go through surgery. We were in and out of the hospital for about 18 months, and Roy had uh, six surgeries at the time, and uh, then he had one more surgery when he was seven years old. Think about what a baby goes through in a neonatal intensive care unit. And those babies are so very fragile. Various kinds of treatments that are given to them and yet they are passive recipients. Children in that preverbal uh, period experience all kinds of things, witnessing domestic violence, for instance, or um, being sexually or physically abused. But one thing that is not often talked about is how many children experience medical trauma of one sort or another in the preverbal period. When Lou was in medical school, he was horrified at the response that the attending physicians had made to babies who appeared to be in pain. And so Lou asked these attending physicians, what about these babies who have just been circumcised who are crying in pain or babies who have had abdominal surgery. And the response of those senior physicians was, oh, babies don't feel pain. Their nervous systems are not sufficiently developed. No mother who has seen a child in that kind of situation is going to say it doesn't hurt. It's no fun to have people doing things to your body that you're not in control of, but when they're doing hurtful things to your body, that's another dimension because a person couldn't say, here's what happened to me as a child, but the person couldn't forget bodily pains, a sensation of being abandoned, a feeling of being um, tortured. What we know now is that people who did not have adequate analgesics or um, uh, anesthesia developed psychiatric symptoms that were essentially PTSD. Many individuals went on to develop symptoms such as 
anxiety and low self-esteem, feelings of shame and guilt that seem to come out of almost nowhere. I've been writing a, a blog about infant surgery since 2009. And at first it was called My Incision, and then it morphed into RestoryYourLife.com. I worked as a church pastor for most of my life. Uh, before that, I had gone through four years of university, followed by four years of theological training. And uh, through my life, I've found interest in specialising in pastoral care courses and hospital chaplaincy and that sort of thing. The blog that I started in 2011, at the beginning of 2011, um, about three, four months after I retired from full-time work, I felt while I was working full-time that was uh, more than enough. But uh, long before 2011, I had been researching the whole subject of infant surgery and some of its connections and building networks. Some of the responses uh, are people who just want to very briefly tell their story but don't really expect an ongoing conversation. Most of the interest does not have to do with trauma but with um, hard information about the surgery. A contact, you might say a friend of mine, also an XPS person in Great Britain, was able to access his record in considerable detail from one of the, or from the leading children's hospital in London. And he was tremendously helped and reassured by that. Um, it made the whole story of what happened to him just that little bit more real. It also filled in certain questions. He learnt that he'd had light ether anaesthesia. Wendy Williams also mentioned to me that she was able to go back to the hospital where she had her surgery. Just being in that building and being shown kindness and consideration and respect by the, some of the staff there that guided her and took her to the wards where she had been uh, treated during her hospitalization. There's no records that are left, but I, I know that I didn't get in any case adequate pain control. And as soon as I read that, you know, babies were often given a paralytic instead of anesthesia, I just felt, oh my God, that's it. In my case, not only have my records disappeared, but the hospital has been demolished. And I would love to be able to go back to the hospital and walk the corridors and be shown what the wards were like, what the operating theatre was like. Um, just look at some of the photos on the walls of the historical record of that hospital would be tremendously helpful. When we would tell people that our son had gone for treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder related to these surgeries he'd had, most of them, you know, age four and under, people were just kind of very skeptical. And they would be like, well, isn't that what soldiers have? We're at UC Davis. We're at the Health Sciences Library, Carlson Health Sciences Library. This is where I found out that babies didn't receive anesthesia for the most part. One of the great things about coming here was I found textbooks where they showed all the different types of uh, incisions that were made back in the day. And um, I understood my scar more, caref more completely by, by looking at the different diagrams. Questions I'd had all my life, but didn't feel like I could ask anyone uh, about it. Um, Some of it is when you research and see the violence that was done to you, even though it was unwitting or unknowing and unintentional and it wasn't malicious, um, it was violent. And then you end up as a person being a violent person. I think if society wants to be a peaceful society, I think this is one of the areas that we have to look at uh, preverbal trauma because I think a lot of people are carrying huge rage from a period where they were violated and they don't even understand it, so they're acting out in ways that I'm sure they wish they would understand themselves.
And I've just clenched my teeth since I can't remember never having clenched them. It's just a part of my life, and I've cracked all my fillings. Um, the dentist pulled my mother into a session once and, and opened my mouth and showed her I had chewed the entire inside of my mouth off. It was like, it was like the Grand Canyon in there. I'd wake up with headaches, wake up with jaw aches, um, wake up with uh, tension in my whole head and face. And um, so later this tension even ended up with me, you know, going to a jaw specialist in my 20s because of the acute pain. When I think about it now, even TMJ didn't know about it a lot. בקושי מישהו ידע על זה, חשבו שמשהו, אולי משהו, אתה יודע, שנולדים ומשהו לא, לא מסתדר עם הזה. עכשיו אני מבינה יותר שזה באמת העניין של המתח בשרירים שיצר את זה. all sorts of variables. The origin of that PTSD, I, I still wonder whether it was transferred from my parents' trauma or whether it was surgical, whether it was hospitalization. We got married in 1969. Fred was an individual and fairly pr private person in those years, and I can think about it now. I can think about, I can see why. I also started to experiment with the actual scar in a way which I can now see is, is naive and childish, but what else could I expect? I was convinced that what I had on my belly was string of some kind buried under the skin, and so I started to poke around. And that made me feel good. It, I found it comforting. I've now discovered, of course, that that was a form of self-harming. It releases endorphins and that that gives a feeling of well-being, kills any feeling of pain. And so my experiments with my scar went on from there. It's like there were two different kids. There was the, the bright, successful student who was head of the drum line, who was jazz band drummer, a lead in every play, on the academic team, in National Honor Society, in the gifted and talented program, um, you know, seemed to do everything well. And then there was the dark side that made these impulsive decisions. We didn't know to be worried because it's not like we had a before trauma and an after trauma child couldn't tell us why he was acting that way or feeling that way. Um, but to be honest, we had a lot of trouble getting anybody to believe that it was a concern, including for a while a problem with getting my husband to think there was anything wrong. I think my experience with uh, raising our son was so much different than Jolene's because she's, she, uh, she would say things quite frequently like, there is an issue, there is a problem, there's something that needs to be addressed. And I would hear her and wonder, I mean, I just wonder where, where's that coming from? Because he's just, just a normal kid, he's just got his own unique issues. My interpretation of, uh, of his response to what he's dealing with is he's self-centered and self-serving and manipulative. <laughs> Nobody really took it seriously until after his junior year in high school, after he turned 18, he ran away and went hitchhiking for three days. It can look like self-serving manipulation when actually it's well-planned self-preservation. <laughs> then people started, I think, understanding, but even then, after that happened, I insisted that he go through some counseling. But the counselor was kind of like, well, really, he's a 
he's a really creative kid and he's very intelligent. I think he's just exploring the world. That began a pattern of running that continued for several years. A parent stepped forward because her baby died and she absolutely demanded to find out what happened and then realized, oh, her child wasn't given any kind of anesthetic or pain control and he was a preemie baby. And it was a hugely invasive procedure that was done. And so she came forward and went public with this information. And then also there was a study done in England that corroborated that babies were dying mostly from pain rather than from like the condition that they went into the hospital for. The early 1980s, when Dr. Sunny Anand, who was uh, doing a residency at Oxford, where he showed that babies, in fact, do feel pain. And after that point in time, after 1987, the doctors started using anesthesia in very carefully monitored amounts. What he noticed was that the newborns that came in after radical major surgery, they would come in to the NICU in, in shock. The morbidity rate was sky high, and he, and he couldn't figure out what was happening that was making these kids recover so poorly, if at all. And so he asked if he could go into the operating room and observe some surgeries. And what he found when he went in to observe, what he learned was that newborns weren't given any pain medication, just this paralytic. And he was quite appalled by that. And somehow he was able to convince the powers that be to do a study where half of the infants were, went through surgery, as was the traditional method, and half of them were given pain medication. And what began happening very quickly was that the, the children who were given the pain medication, their recovery rates were much better. Morbidity rate went way down. That they finally had to stop the study before it was completed and release the results because it was going to save so many children's lives. The parts arise from the fact that we start off with two hemispheres when we are born, and those hemispheres do not communicate directly with each other. But as the corpus callosum receives its myelinating sheath, which is kind of like getting insulation around an electrical cord, then it starts transmitting information from one hemisphere to the other. The movie called Inside Out is a wonderful depiction of parts that are based on uh, feelings like sadness and joy, fear and anger. Now disdain is another part that they throw in there sort of for comic relief, but these four basic uh, feelings give rise to different parts. And in that movie, what you see is how people's inner landscape is experienced. From there, we can develop a whole host of parts. We can develop worker parts. We can develop caretaker parts. They are, in some ways, like roles in that um, they kind of mirror what we do in the outside world. But in other ways, they mirror various kinds of feelings, not just those four basic ones that I had named. We all have parts. It's just that it's on, experienced on a continuum so that people who are aware of their parts and who only have a few parts or relatively few are able to communicate with them and have a well-organized team. Take someone who has dissociative identity disorder and one of the cardinal features of that disorder is that you have parts that can be amnestic for each other. So you can have one part that doesn't know about another part or um, parts that feel that 
the body that they are in is different from the body that the other parts are in. It sort of um, defies logic, but there are people who think that um, if one part kills off the body, that part will still survive. וזה לא היה סקרי אחד, זה היה כל הניתוחים היו סקרי, כי כל פעם המחשבה, הפחד שאולי לא תצא מזה, וכל פעם אותו דבר, הפחד שלא תצא מזה. ברקע הטלוויזיה הודיע שרצחו את ג'ון לנון, ורואי בידיים שלי בכאב נורא, היית בכאב נורא. כמה שהיית קטן ורזה, הכאב הזה נתן לך כאלה כוחות שבקושי יכולתי להחזיק אותך. התפתלת מכאבים נוראים. ואני שם ישבתי, ו... וגם אני נקרעתי, נקרעתי מזה של... מהכאב, מהכאב שלך, שאני בעצם לא יכולה לעזור לך שום דבר, ושאתה סובל את הכאב הנורא הזה. עד שבבוקר באו ואמרו לי שאתה צריך לעבור ניתוח. My parents found it impossible to talk about the surgery to any significant extent. When I asked about the scar and about what had happened, they would say only very general things such as you were sick and that's what the doctor did to make you better. Or we'll talk about that some other time. My parents would sometimes explain what happened to adults in a way that was a little bit more detailed than what they ever told me. And um, I was listening into these conversations and feeling embarrassed and um, uncomfortable. For all of us who are parents of kids who've had a lot of medical interventions, I think we need to recognize that that's very traumatic for us too. And the problem is that we don't have time to process our trauma when our children are young, and, and they need us. I remember after the big surgery, I came home, I slept on the floor, and I slept for a day. I was exhausted completely, physically and physically. I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat. I was so beautiful. We basically had four years where we were on edge constantly because of medical issues. Some of these parents are dealing with it throughout their lives. At some point, we need to step back and probably get some professional help to uh, process our own trauma. Charles, now you're an adult, but we're going to tell this story about when you were only one month old and you had to have an operation for pyloric stenosis. So what I want you to do is to put yourself in the frame of mind that you would if you were going to a movie. And you're gonna find this to be a very interesting movie, but the important thing is you're not in the movie. I'm gonna tell this story from start to finish and incorporate all those things that you learned about the instinctual trauma response. The startle affected his entire body. His body was on alert for whatever was going to happen. Baby Charlie did not have words for this experience and did not have any concept of what was about to happen next. Here we see the monitor that he was hooked up to, and we see the bright lights here in the operating room. Those doctors looked pretty strange with those masks on their faces. All that could be seen were their eyes. Baby Charlie started fighting for his life. He had the thwarted intention. He was trying to either fight or flee, but he was unable to do either. He went into the freeze. This was something that his brain just did because that's the way that brains operate when under the threat of a life 
life-threatening situ uh, situation. The higher parts of his brain went offline. Baby Charlie went into the altered state of consciousness. And many people will say, well, does, is a baby really conscious? Well, certainly the, in instances like this, the body is experiencing things that the mind cannot comprehend. We accept the structure of fairy tales as having a kernel of truth that is far beyond what historical accounts can give us. So we have historical truth and we have narrative truth. And here is the narrative truth of the fact that little baby Charlie was put into a situation where he went into a state of being that's totally unlike what babies would ordinarily experience. Baby Charlie had gone into automatic obedience, just doing whatever it was that the surgeons wanted him to do. So they would move his arms and his legs or roll his body over, and he offered no resistance. At long last, at least from baby Charlie's perspective, he was through the operation and was able to indulge in self-repair. Now, Charles, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. Are you okay? Okay. I've always wanted to scuba dive. And, uh, you know, being a marine biology major, that was pretty key. So I went scuba diving once, and I had a traumatic experience. I didn't understand it. So when I was in my 30s, I got really buff and in shape, and did. I was a beautiful swimmer. And I said, I'm going to go do this scuba again. So Griffin bought me a package, my wife. She bought me a, a nice like weekend thing, two weekends. And I trained. And, and then again, I couldn't do the test. I freaked out in the pool. One day after that, I submerged myself and I heard the bubbling of the motors and the water, you know, the, 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 the jacuzzi. And then it was like, oh my God, I got it. I was like, oh my God, that was the sound I heard as a baby laying there either with the respirator going or me on the intubation machine. But I finally realized like what, uh, what was being triggered. So whenever I had the scuba gear on, I was being triggered because when you have the gear on, you hear the blah, 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 the bubbles. If I had understood it, I could have worked with it. I knew as soon as I understood the connection between the sounds of the scuba and my surgery because I was being sent back unconsciously to a time when I was completely, you know, helpless, out of control, in pain and terrified and near death. I noticed that at a very young age, right from the very beginning, he would startle. He had a very quick startle. Uh, so I consider that's just part of his inner workings. He startled easy. He startles easy. If there was lightning, he would panic, as, even as a baby, uh, even pre-verbal. And before I realized what he's going through, it was entertaining. Turn on the vacuum cleaner, and he'd be running in place and screaming at the top of his lungs. Well, that was kind of funny. But you look back, and <laughs> he was he was maxed out in a very ex very out of control, scary situation, and that's not funny at all. In uh, then in junior high and high school, that seemed to accentuate as he got more opportunities for responsibility. It it didn't go as it seemed it would. Uh, this, guy, this guy with all sorts of intelligence and capabilities um, would not be responsible. So my version of responsible is um, setting a goal and achieving it or making a promise and keeping it. That's responsible. Which is a stark contrast to the way my son is now. Um, after going through treatment, his mode of operating is to make promises, make commitments, enter into, enter into arrangement with a long-term um, outcome 
that's beneficial for all p parties involved. That's his mode of operating. Bator Yeled, no, no, I didn't see it, and no, I didn't see it. כי היית ילד מאוד יצירתי, חברותי, היית מאוד outgoing, לא התביישת מאנשים, לא התחבאת. זאת אומרת, עד גיל שנתיים וחצי בערך כן, אבל אחר כך ממש לא. כל הזמן היו לך מסגרות, גן, בית ספר, אחר כך הצבא ואחר כך הלימודים. נראה לי כשיצאת ממסגרות, נראה לי שאז יותר יצא החוצה, יותר בלט, שהיית צריך להביא את עצמך לעשייה, ואז זה התחיל לבלוט החוסר ביטחון, ונראה לי בדיכאון וחרדה. I just wanted to protect myself all the time. And so a lot of my decisions were made about protection rather than reaching out for uh, enjoyment or reaching out for pleasure or reaching out for things I desire. I would make decisions based on the best protection. It was your lack of coordination that set you apart from a lot of the other young people. And you felt that strongly. Um, and I certainly felt that too at the time. But I thought, it doesn't matter. I still mm. like you as a person. Mm. It was sometimes embarrassing, but that's how it was. But your unconditional love, I think, did mean a lot. It does mean a lot to me. Mm. But it was um, very healing in those days. Mm. I'm going to have a bit of coffee. Your coffee, Rose. I mean, I think sometimes she wants me to be more patient or wants me to be different than who I am, but I think that's the important message, is stay with who you are and see them for who they are. Lou was able to do some very interesting research, and one of the things that he tried was to see if you could have a very good way of getting a trauma story from an individual. You know, um, sodium mammitol was considered a kind of truth serum, so he was comparing the sodium mammitol and guided imagery, which is a form of hypnosis, and nitrous oxide, and he wanted to see which of those three conditions gave the best result. Well, what he found when he was, he had studied over 70 patients under those conditions, was that the people who finished the story were the ones who had the best outcome, regardless of whether they used hypnosis or nitrous oxide or sodium mammitol. There was no other trauma in my life, no abuse of any form, and I grew up in a, a stable setting without marital tensions between my parents, uh, without major tragedies happening during our family life years. I concluded that it must be connected with my surgery or something to do with my surgery. When I finally understood what she knew all along was this conversation that um, I had with a school counselor. And she was describing why she was a school, school counselor. We were out to eat together and uh, she said, well, it's because uh, when I, I grew up in an abusive home and I understand that dimension of abuse and I can recognize it and I know what to do about it. And I said, well, you can recognize it. Tell me what you see when you recognize an abusive home. And then she says, well, the, she listed off patterns of behavior. You, you, um, it, it looks manipulative. It looks controlling. Um, and she, she listed off a number of things and she basically just described our son. And I'm just like, you just described our son and he's never been abused. We just all looked at each other. <laughs> no, I'm serious, he has not ever been abused, but you have described him to a T. This is how you pick out somebody who's been abused. I haven't sought treatment 
partly because I was very private and very fearful of opening myself about my inner problems to anyone. I've mentioned the manic search of books, which really didn't yield very much. But even today, I, I have, I'm a bit manic, I must say, about hunting down people's stories of infant surgery. Sometimes I wonder whether it's an addiction and then I tell myself, yes, it is to some extent, because my mind over the years has been wired up to be obsessed with this. I think I'm still hungry for affirmation from other people that the problems and fears that I've had don't make me loopy or weird, but are a normal part of human reaction to the kind of trauma that I've been through. Anybody who has um, owned a house that's made out of bricks or stone can see cracks that are in the first and second stories. But if you don't check out the origin of the cracks and figure out whether they did start in the foundation, you will be spinning your wheels because you can patch those cracks, but in another couple of years, they're going to open up again. So think about that with respect to therapy. You can do a lot of work on problems that are bothering you in the present that originated after you had language. But if you are neglecting the preverbal experiences you didn't have language for, then you are working with a very um, shaky foundation. The good news is that the foundation can be repaired. They seal the chayim shalcha. אבל מצד שני זה גם הרס את החיים שלך. אז משני הצדדים, כן? כאב של אז, ש... שעד היום, זה בכלל, זה... זה... אני חושבת שזה בריא מאוד לעשות את זה, במקום לשאיר את זה בפנים. ואז משהו אחר קורה בפנים שם. Our model is that the pain is between your ears, it's in your brain, but it doesn't make that pain any less important or any less real. It's a symptom that is out of context. In some cases, certain medications really don't work any better than placebo or than exercise. Now, I'm not totally dismissing the role of medication and I agree with Lou that medication gives a floor for a lot of people, but it doesn't go to the root cause of their very troubling symptoms. We don't really have to have a psychiatrist prescribing medications because that's not where the focus of the treatment is. The focus of the treatment was on processing the stories, and this could be done with art therapists, social workers, or counselors. I wrote a book called Autobiography of a Sea Creature. I think one of the hardest things is that even though there was no kind of physical repercussions, there were a lot of uh, emotional difficulties that I suffered after. And uh, medicine didn't really acknowledge those. So I had to kind of deal with it by myself. So I tried to, you know, I wrote the book to try to understand my experience better. So many things that medicine knows that the public should know we don't know, and medicine doesn't feel obligated to let other people know. Doing surgery on babies without anesthesia, through the years, doctors have said that was sometimes necessary, and the argument ran that infants, especially the premature, simply did not feel pain the way adults do. But now a mother's anguish has put that theory under attack. Jeffrey Lawson, more than three months premature, died several weeks after major heart surgery. Surgery performed, his mother later learned, with no anesthesia. They cut him open from his breastbone all the way around to his backbone, cut through all the layers of tissue, 
fried as long as the side. With nothing at all? Absolutely nothing. Techniques. There is strong evidence that surgery in the neonate without adequate anesthesia and analgesic results in poor outcome. Yay! It began a, a couple centuries ago. There was a, a time in the 19th century where um, babies were believed to be subhuman, almost that they grew into who they were. And they started out more like an animal than like a person. How much to give a tiny baby was a hard thing to judge. And if you gave them too much, you could cause other kinds of damage. Um, brain damage or death even if they were over medicated and so because they had this research that said newborns don't feel pain they believe the safest method was then well let's not give them any pain medication just something to paralyze them. There may be rare instances when it's necessary to reduce the amount of pain relieving medicine but it should be extremely unusual. Let me read that again. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Infants were considered incapable of perceiving pain. Indeed, Dr. Abel Pearson stated that, quote, infants could sleep insensibly even while undergoing surgery, end quote. Chest tube insertions and other procedures like that might not, you might not see local anesthesia being used. That's very true. And, but that hurts, right? Oh, that certainly hurts, yes. In later years, people wanted to know, well, where did this faulty research come from? And some, some researchers went back and started reviewing the literature, and what they finally concluded was that in the early 1900s, the standard method for women in labor was to deliver an anesthesia that was called twilight sleep to them. So the, the mothers went to sleep, and they woke up after the baby was born. It went through the umbilical cord, and the infants, when they were born, then were anesthetized. So they didn't feel the needle when they on that first day you know and as it gradually wore off their reactions became more of what we expect so that's why that faulty reasoning came about however reports from this time period can be found describing anesthesia administered to infants in the first months of life john snow preferred chloroform and wrote in 1855 quote chloroform may be given with propri propriety to patients of all ages I have exhibited it to several infants aged from 10 days to three weeks. Good for him. He went on to say, quote, chloroform acts very favorably on infants and children. There has, I believe, been no death from chloroform under the age of 15 years, end of quote. So there is, I mean, I've, I've known about this. There, of course, you know, it's not across the board that, that anesthesia was withheld, um, especially in, um, like urban areas, large urban areas, uh, there was more likelihood of it ha of being used. But it was it's inconsistent. Um, how do you how do you know? It certainly does happen, and uh, it happens uh, uh, in uh, the best of places. I think if uh, all of us who have had ex uh, infant surgery, especially in the years before 1990, uh, have a better understanding of the different factors that may have affected us from the way in which uh, we went through this experience, this often initial experience and very traumatic time in our lives. If we had a better understanding of that, we would also be better able to cope and to heal and to build and to make decisions about ourselves and about our future. And um, with the help of caring and understanding and, and loving people around us, uh, rebuild some of the damage that has been uh, done in earlier years. לילד קל יותר לבטא את עצמו בגוף שלישי, שבמקום לדבר מתוך עצמו, בהרבה יותר קל לו לשים את זה על הבובה ולהביע את הכאב שלו ואת הפחדים שלו. וזאת המטרה של, של הבובות, גם להכין אותם ואחר כך לדבר, לדבר בשמם. To be, to be with you while they were 
uh, treating you, uh, uh, giving uh, injections and, uh, and holding you. And I felt in a way that I, uh, the way you look at me as I'm co cooperating with the, with the enemy. But it was, of course, for you good, for you good because uh, they had to, to do whatever they were doing. So it was very hard. Once we realized that a lot of these mental illnesses are physiological in nature, that they actually can be seen just like a cut on your hand, you know, it's, it's a cut or a wound in your brain. As a teacher, too, all those years of watching kids learn and seeing them grow and, and change the way they looked at the world, um, I, I think it's fascinating and important for us to understand that. It takes a lot of the stigma of the mental illness away, and it's a lot easier, I think, than for parents or young adults who've experienced it to say, you know, this is a, an injury just like a broken leg would be an injury. So who wouldn't go in and get treatment for a broken leg? This is a good example of how a person had a lot of bodily sensations because of preverbal trauma, but couldn't articulate them. Now, she knew that she was given up for adoption and placed in an orphanage, and it was in a foreign country. She uh, said many times she was tortured in that orphanage. No, no orphanage would be doing that sort of torturing of the baby. We realized that these heavy incisions represented what uh, nurses and doctors call cutdowns. That's when a person needs an intravenous um, feeding, but the veins in the arms are too difficult, uh, they're too uh, small to be able to uh, do a conventional IV. And so you cut down into the wrists, the ankles, and uh, by the neck, and that's where you administer the IVs. And so she was so malnourished when she was given up for adoption that this is the only way they could keep her alive is to give her these very painful feedings. But once we could talk to her about the fact that, yes, her body felt like it was torture, but this was done so that they could save her life, then she started to see her experience in a different way. It's difficult once you mine it and bring it up and look at it later, you say, oh my God. Baby Charlie survived and we have adult Charlie here with us in the room, and we can say the story is now over with. The end.